Hello and welcome to episode 2 of my Rapid Chess versus Viewers series. Now my viewers are selected from my Discord, so if you want a chance to play me, or just join a chess community generally, then my Discord is linked below if you fancy joining, completely free obviously. And I kind of just pick people at random to play against in there. And yesterday we played against Jeetan, who was rated over 2000. That was an incredible game, so check it out in the playlist below if you want to see that. Today we're playing against a much lower rated 459 Spectre. Now Spectre, I appreciate you um, wanting to play. Uh, I think he was a bit worried about the rating disparity, but it should be an interesting game nonetheless. Now my opponent plays Dakaro Khan, so clearly that's probably one of the reasons why he's a fan of the channel, because I play a lot of Karo Khan myself. And against Dakaro, like I've said many times before, you can play a variety of different things. You can play d4, you can play knight c3, knight d2, d3 is even a move, knight f3. There's also bishop c4, which I believe is known as the hillbilly attack, which is also a move. I quite like this setup personally, though, with e4, c6, b3, d5. And the idea is to go bishop b2 and straight up give the e4 pawn away. This is very similar to what happens when I play against the French defense. So just imagine this pawn on c7 and this pawn on e6. And I like to play this same gambit. I've got a playlist dedicated to like games against the French where I play b3. But I also like to throw the Caro games in there as well because some of the ideas are very similar. The main difference being that against the Caro, the bishop can get out to f5 to defend the pawn once he takes, whereas in the French, when a pawn is on e6, that's not possible. So it's a slightly better version for black. Uh, I think the computer gives it a, around zeros or maybe minus 0.1, um, but it's very tricky to play, which is why I'm a big fan of it. So I think there was a problem with the audio for the pieces moving, but I believe I've fixed that now, uh, hence the tiny time jump there. My opponent goes knight d7. This is a bit odd, because it doesn't really address the pawn at all. Um, I'm tempted to push e5 here, and I know that blocks my bishop off, but his knight is a bit awkward now. Um, if I push e5, I feel like. And if he goes e6, we're going to have very strong control over f6, which makes moves like queen g4 quite powerful, attacking g7. And it's difficult for black to defend that, because he can't put a queen on f6. So let's just say e5, e6, and just queen g4. He does have knight h6 in that scenario. But under the right circumstances, we can put a lot of pressure on g7, and it can be very difficult for our opponent to kick us out. Because moves like knight f6 or queen to f6 are not going to be possible because our pawn will be controlling that square. So I'm going to go e5. I'm just going to take a bit more space. I'd also like to support that with f4. You could, of course, play d4 to try and support the pawn on e5. But that's kind of susceptible to c5, which is a typical break in the Karo Khan as it is. And also, it sort of blocks my bishop off, right? Because if we go f4 and this pawn ends up taking something on f6, say a pawn goes there to challenge me, I obviously don't have to take it, but I have the option to. But if I do, my bishop will be open. Whereas if I've got a pawn on d4 and he goes for f6, taking my bishop still remains blocked in because there's a pawn on d4. So I think it gives a bit more flexibility to go f4 rather than d4. And also d4 is more easily underminable. I don't know if that's a word, but it can be undermined a bit more easily by the move c5 because black is going to have a lot of uh, support for that pawn push, especially if he plays moves like queen b6 or e6 opening the bishop up, right? Because the knight on d7 already controls that square. Whereas f4, it's far harder to undermine the pawn. I say this in so many videos, a pawn chain is only as strong as its base. And I feel like an f4 pawn is stronger than a d4 pawn. Now you might be saying, wait, but a pawn on d4 is going to be supported by the bishop and the queen. You're absolutely right. But like I said, c5 undermines it for quite well. Whereas on f4, you have to play g5 to try and undermine it. And 
I don't believe in that, the black. Maybe it's playable in some positions, but it's also very anti-positional to open up your kingside like that, especially when you're probably going to castle that way. And leaves this diagonal potentially vulnerable if this pawn ever moves. Although it probably will remain there for a very long time. So, f4 looks like a natural move to me. My opponent might go knight h6, trying to get the knight into f5, which is a typical idea. But we could go f4, d4 anyway. Um... We could just put both pawns out, so then if c5 happens, it's not that big a deal if the d pawn falls, because the f pawn will be supporting anyway. But I'd like to start with f4, since I just did a whole spiel about why I wanted to do that. So, oh, I think a few of you might be watching the game, by the way, <laughs> in the Discord. A few of you guys might be watching live, so um, hope you enjoy. Um Labs, I see you, bro. Labs is an OG. If, um, well, if you're just a normal viewer, uh, you might not know who he is, but he's an OG. Top bloke. Hope you recovered from your hangover, mate. Um, so, yeah, for those of you who are new to the channel, by the way, uh, I release videos every single day, which I play rapid games most of the time. But more so with the intention of educating and explaining my thought process like I've been doing, rather than simply just playing chess. And I feel like 2000 is about what I'm rated. It's fairly high, but it's not so high that my thought process is too difficult to understand, which I feel like happens sometimes when you watch like Grandmasters or something play. Don't get me wrong, they're fully better at chess than me, and a lot of them would probably be better coaches than me. But if you're, you know, rated under 1200 or under 1500 or something, it's less of a jump to 2000 than to a rating like 2500. So my point is, I'm trying to help you improve by explaining my thought process while I play so that you can try and take on some ideas of a 2000 rated player that are more easily digestible. Because uh, I feel like I'm decent at explaining things. Um, otherwise, I don't see why people would be watching. So, um, yeah, I, I suppose I can blow my own trumpet a little bit. Spectre's playing some... I'd say passive moves. Not bad. Not bad moves, but passive. H6 is a bit odd. It controls g5, but I wasn't really planning on putting anything there. Maybe he's worried about like knight f3, knight g5 in the future, but mm, I don't really want to do that. I could develop my bishop. I could go d4 now, and then go knight d2, because I don't really want to put the knight on c3, because it blocks my bishop off. Right? Uh, and the knight's got nowhere to go anyway from c3 because all these squares are controlled by black. Bishop e2 is on my radar. Knight f3 is the most natural move. But then it blocks my queen from coming to g4. Although, queen g4 here might be good, because he doesn't have knight h6, because he just put a pawn there. But if I go queen g4 and he goes h5, then because that comes with tempo, right? Then if I drop my queen back, then knight h6... And he's coming into f5. So if I go queen g4 h5, it might be better to come to h3. So that if knight h6 is played, I can take the pawn. Because the rook's undefended. And there's no useful discoveries. Queen g4 h5, queen h3. He could go knight e7, looking at f5. But if he comes to f5, it's not really that scary. Because my queen's out of the way. And it doesn't matter that my queen's lined up with his bishop like this, because there's too many things in the way. This pawn is not going anywhere unless I play f5 and allow it. So, I'm going to play queen g4. And I'm just going to put pressure on g7. It makes it difficult for him to develop his bishop. And if he tries to develop the bishop by playing g6 and bishop g7, one, I could argue that he's going to be susceptible for, to bishop a3, looking at this diagonal. I could also try to break open his structure with moves like h4. 
Wow, g5. So that was the idea of h6. To play g5. Interesting. I don't think he carries a threat. I don't really want to take him. Because he can take with the pawn or take with the queen. And that looks good for him. So I'm tempted just to go knight f3. I'm considering knight h3 as well, so I target both. But uh, the g5 pawn's well defended, so there's no point attacking it. Mm, knight f3, if he takes, I take with the queen. That looks pretty good. And his king side looks quite weak there. If I develop my bishop and castle, I'm going to build a battery on the f file, which could be useful. f5 is on my radar to try and break apart his structure. But then I'm opening up his bishop and my queen is in the crossfire. So I think developing makes more sense. If h5 is pushed, then I can just take on g5, I think. And bishop e7 isn't trapping my queen or anything because of moves like queen g7. Uh, I also have the g4 square available to me. Uh, oh, sorry. There's something like this and um, I can just retreat to g3 if I need to. So that's not a problem. Just had to check that though. Uh, my bishop's probably going to come to d3 or e2 depending d3 is the square that I want the bishop on, because this is a interesting diagonal. But then I could be vulnerable to moves like knight c5, targeting the bishop. Whereas on e2, the bishop's kind of just nice and out of the way. Although it's also doing less, because this diagonal, I would argue, is less important than this one. If I can get the bishop to h5, though, it does put pressure on f7, which could be nice. I think um, we're getting some nice development, right? We've got our bishop out, our knight out, our queen out. This knight is going to get developed. This bishop's going to get developed. I'm probably going to castle kingside, although I do have the option of going queenside if I want to. The f file is most likely going to open up as well. So we can use a rook on the f file to put pressure on f7, which is definitely a weak pawn. Uh, also, this bishop could be good on d3 because... If this rook goes to h7 to try and guard f7, we uh, stop that. He goes f6, so he's really trying to break apart my structure, uh, this wedge in the center, which I totally understand. However, f7 and g5 have weakened this diagonal, so I should just be able to give a check here. And he can't block this check. He has no knight on f6 guarding the h5 square, which is normally the case, or a knight on e7 that can maybe hop to g6, but g6 is undefended anyway, so that wouldn't be helpful. He's got to play king e7, and now we need to calculate, because the king is really running out of squares to go to. So king e7, the first move that should come to your mind is probably bishop to e3, this would be very, very good and force him to sacrifice a knight to give the king the d7 square if he didn't have the move c5. So bishop a3, c5. Then what do we do? Well, it's not simple, I don't think, to continue the attack. An interesting move might be f5, trying to force lines open, but we could just take... Hmm. I'm also tempted to take on g5, because he can't take with the h-pawn, because his rook hangs. So we'd have to take back with the f-pawn. Then if we gave this check, c5... We could go d4, but then he can play b6, and his bishop might get out like that. And I mean, we should be winning, but we're going to have to try and prove this. I'd like to get some more pieces into the attack. We could give a check and just play knight c3. If he takes... Mm, 
I was considering f5 to try and destabilize d5, which my knight would be attacking if we can get him to take us. But if bishop a3, c5, knight c3, and he takes on f4, then we don't have f5. Mm. But if we play bishop a3, c5, knight c3, threatening f5 to destabilize the d5 pawn and he takes us then we could consider knight to h4 because he'll no longer be attacking that square to try and get into g6 which would be a pretty deadly check but my only problem is if we go bishop a3 c5 knight c3 he does have a queen e8 trying to trade queens with us which we, there's no way we want to do that. <sighs> okay, what if we take on f6? What if we take on f6? This should be a winning position, but I want to try and prove it accurately. Okay, if we take on f6, let's say knight gf6, that comes with an attack on our queen. I'm not a fan of that. So I'm going to take on g5. I feel like I have bishop a3 in my back pocket whenever I want. Uh, it might have been the best move in the first place, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, but taking here looks quite simple. Because he can't take back with the h-pawn, so we're kind of forcing f takes. Then this knight is in jail, because he can't go to h6, can't go to f6 ever, because this pawn is now totally secure because he can't challenge it with any pawn push once this pawn takes um and then i can't go to e7 because the king is currently on e7 so if fg5 again we can consider bishop a3 c5 we we can consider taking on g5 because if takes, then he loses the rook. So, fg5, knight g5. We are threatening uh, queen f7 checkmate as well. So, he might play queen to e8 to try and trade queens with us. But then we can take and take on e6. And then we're up two pawns. We're threatening knight c7 check, winning the rook. Being up two pawns should be a fairly easy conversion, especially because our pawn structure is very nice and we still have a ton of space. I just can't seem to find an easy way to prove my to like prove advantage through checkmate. But like many people say, an attack doesn't have to end in checkmate. If it ends in the winning of a fair bit of material, then that works, right? That's absolutely fine. That's good enough. So, okay, is there anything better than takes, takes, queen e8, takes, takes, knight e6? Because that is good. Um, if takes... Okay, what happens if we throw in bishop a3? Bishop a3, c5... Ooh. Well, now we're winning a piece. I'm kind of confused as to why he played bishop g7. I guess he was really worried about knight g5 and queen f7. And the fact that his rook was undefended. But I guess we can just... Take. I don't think it matters which pawn we take with, although I'd rather take with this pawn so that we control d6 still. Okay, I don't think we need to hesitate too much. Like I said, if an attack ends in winning a significant amount of material, then that's fine. We're already up two pawns, so if you play something like knight f6, ef6 knight f6 
and we go something like queen h4, then we're going to be up a full piece. Because while he wins these two pawns, we've already won his g and f pawns in return. So it's just a straight up piece. Um, and I like queen h4 as well, because after knight f6, ef6, knight f6, queen h4, we maintain a lot of pressure and the knight remains pinned to the king. Now in the scenario of knight takes, pawn takes, knight takes, I don't like bishop takes, I don't think. Because after bishop takes, eh, there's just some issues on this diagonal. He takes with the bishop. That is surprising. I thought he'd try to preserve the bishop. So we're going to take, obviously. But now his knights are kind of tangled up. And I think we should just play queen h4 again. But I think this time it's worse for him because this knight is blocking the development of this bishop. And he has no bishop to challenge our dark squared bishop with. So this could be quite problematic for him. I think there's a ton of ways to win that. Here, surely we can just take that. Take, take, take. We're attacking the knight. Something like rook f8. Hmm. I kind of want to play bishop e2 and just castle, to be honest. Just to get my rook involved and get my king safe. Because I want to put more pressure on the knight. Um, and if he goes for a move like e4 then I can just play knight e5, because I achieved the same goal of trying to remove this knight, but I don't care about winning the pawn. We're already up a piece, this pawn is irrelevant. So, yeah, I think I like bishop e2. And I'm like, bro, if you want to play e4, then play it. It might be smarter for him to play d4, to try and shut my bishop out. But if he goes d4, then I think I can castle and there's going to be a ton of tactics with knight takes e5 because not only will f6 be in a lot of danger but if d4 castles uh, once knight takes and knight takes there are also ideas of bishop d4 and just lining everything up on the f6 knight. So I don't think I'm worried. I don't think I'm worried. Like I said, I'm off a piece as well. Also, if he goes d4, it's worth mentioning that in some positions where the king gets a bit hunted, we might have bishop c4 ideas uh, to get the bishop into the game. So okay, we're um, I think managing our time quite well. It's I mean obviously it's a winning position at this point, and you know. It should be a fairly easy conversion, but I don't want to blunder anything because <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of kind of notorious for that at this point. H6 back here though was just a bit weird because I guess he was literally preparing G5, like that was the idea. And I mentioned, I mentioned previously, I chose F4 over D4 because it's harder to undermine the f4 pawn than the d4 pawn because d4 can be undermined with c5 c5 quite easily whereas f4 can only be undermined with g5 really but i thought that just was too weakening to his position and clearly i think that's come to fruition okay rook g8 puts some pressure on g2 but i don't see how he adds a second attacker so we should just castle it's just castle. And now the pressure is really mounting. Uh, knight e5 is going to be a very dangerous move for him to face. Because if knight takes, then queen f6 check. Uh, that's kind of problematic for him. 
Worst case scenario, we just win a pawn anyway. Or a piece. Yeah, we should win a piece even. And we're obviously already up a piece. So... I think it just makes more sense to try and get more pieces involved in the game. And our king is pretty safe. Queen b6 can be played. We just move our king over. That's not a problem. He's got no dark squared bishop anyway. So this diagonal isn't really that big of a deal. Because he doesn't want to use his queen just to occupy this diagonal. Um, like I said, g2 is fine. Because I don't see how he adds another attacker to it. If he were able to move this knight and play bishop h3, maybe it's a problem. But firstly, how does he move this knight? Because that will drop this knight and this pawn. But also bishop h3 isn't playable because our queen controls that square. So we're not really in any danger. I also didn't want to allow rook g2. Just threatening pieces around my king. I didn't really want to allow that. Okay, rook g4, defended by the knight. That's totally playable. There is the interesting queen f6, because if king f6, knight e5 with discovered check from the rook. But if we take, then he can just take with the knight. So that's not really any good. Uh, I think queen h6 makes a lot of sense. If queen h6, does he want to go queen g8 going after g2? Maybe. And if we go g3, there might be ideas of sacrificing. I think we're probably fine in that scenario because our queen controls the h file. So we shouldn't get perpetualed. But I don't really want to allow it. If queen h6, queen g8... It's kind of annoying... I kind of want to play queen h3, but I also don't want to line this bishop up with my queen. I really want to do that. Um, hmm. Well, these are my only options. And on h3, if he goes for a move like knight c5... This is kind of worrisome. So I think taking on h6 makes far more sense. Queen j is annoying going after g3, sorry g2. But we should be fine. We could even play knight h4 actually. Which I hadn't considered. Which attacks g2, sorry defends g2. Also defends the g6 square so that he can't play rook g6. Our bishop also opens up to attack his rook. Our rook also opens up to attack his knight. And after knight to h4, we have ideas of knight f5 check. That looks like a pretty versatile move to me. Where's he going to move the rook as well? Because if the rook goes to g7, then knight f5 wins the rook. And if knight h4, the rook would probably have to go to g5. We could give this check anyway. Hmm, that looks good. Just making sure I'm not missing anything and that my queen isn't in mortal danger. But I don't think so. I think we should be okay. Fair play to my opponent. He's got a very tough position here, but he's creating some counterplay down the g-file. Which is probably his best option. The issue is he needs to try and get these pieces developed. I have the same problem with my knight and rook, but it's far easier for me to develop my queen side than it is for him to develop his queen side. Because my knight can move to a3 or c3. And then this rook can go on the e-file maybe. Or double up on the f-file. Whereas his bishop is currently blocked in. 
So he needs to either move this knight or this pawn to get the bishop out either way, and then he's able to move his rook. That takes a bit longer than my queen side development does. Also, if he moves this knight to get the bishop out this way, then this knight loses a key defender, which I don't think he can afford to do. So, like I said, he's fighting well, but I feel like he's just going to run out of resources. Rook e4. Rook e4. Okay, I didn't really consider that move. I mean, he attacks the bishop. If we give this check, or this check... Okay, knight f5. If he goes to e8 or f7, then knight d6 wins the rook. So king to d8 looks like the most natural move. It's kind of difficult to punish. We could just play the simple knight c3 though. Which attacks the rook and defends the bishop. And we again ask where he's going to put his rook. So knight c3 is probably just easier. Again, I'm just making sure he's got no shenanigans going on. But because so many of his pieces are kind of out of the game, I don't think I'm in any real danger. Okay, he can... Put the rook on d4 or b4. But if he goes to d4, then knight f5 check wins the rook. So the rook might have to go to b4. But then we have bishop to a3 and he loses the rook. So I think the rook's straight up trapped. Because we control g4 with the bishop. Obviously our queen controls h4. If he goes to f4, then we can give the check on g6 to pick the rook up. If he goes to d4, we give the check on f5. Obviously, we control c4 and a4. And if he goes to b4, then we play bishop a3, skewering the rook. This often happens in um, middle games and openings where a rook can kind of just get trapped in the center of the board because it's difficult for it to find shelter a lot of the time. Our opponent continues to play tricky moves, though. Knight g4... So obviously if we take the rook, then he takes our queen. And if we take the knight, then he has an escape square for his rook. Now, we should consider the moves in knight g6 and knight f5, but I don't see what they do. Something like knight f5, again, the king goes to d8. Ooh, but then we can give a check on h4. The reason that's good is because it means that our queen can move with check, and when the king moves, then we can take the rook, because his knight is no longer attacking us. So that looks winning. If the king goes here, then he's kind of lining this up, and I don't believe he can do that. We can also give a check on d6. If he moves to e8, we can give this check and get the queen out of danger. We can also consider knight d6. Then the king can go back here. Oh, that's unnecessarily complicated. The whole idea is to move the queen with check so that we can take this rook because we'll no longer be under attack. So I'm just going to give the check. This might not be 100% the most accurate line, but I think it's the simplest. Because we're going to take this rook, and then this knight is going to be under attack, because it's going to have lost a defender. Because our queen coming to h5 also puts pressure on the knight. Ooh. Now we can move this knight with a discovery. So knight h6... King e7. We could just take this rook though. I 
I'm just going to take the Rook. Honestly. It's probably not the most accurate move, but a Rook's a Rook. Let's not overthink this. We're low on time. So why would I want to go into something... It's, it's not really that complicated, a move like Knight H6. But I know that taking the Rook is completely winning. This Knight isn't doing anything dangerous over on the King's side. These pieces certainly aren't because they're out of the game. And the Queen can't do anything dangerous by herself. She needs support. But like I said, this Knight... Kind of out of the game, right? Okay, now we can obviously take the Knight... But now I feel like I want to give this check. I could also be fancy and take here. And then if queen takes, then knight here. Let's just do this. I just got way low on time. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> that was for absolutely zero reason. I kind of just froze for a second and forgot that this was my move. Ugh, classic chess centurion, huh? You wouldn't be here if I wasn't doing stupid stuff like that anyway. So that's the entertainment part of the content, intentionally or not. Okay, he goes there. Alright, we can take the queen. He can't take our queen because the knight is pinned. If king takes, then queen g5. Gets out of danger with check. And everything is hanging in this position. And we're up a ton of material anyway. Okay, here we're going to take this to remove the defender of the knight. I'm going to take with the rook so we keep an eye on this bishop with our queen. We have discovered checks with the rook if he goes to e7 goes here, check, we could just win this bishop though, let's just win the bishop, keep things nice and simple, queen e6 check is coming in anyway, and something like queen e6, king d8, queen d6, king e8, and rook f8 will be checkmate, okay, I think we're going to get that pattern. Now, if he goes here and we give this check first, then he escapes. But if we give this check, if he goes here, it's mate. And if he goes here, it's mate. Because we cut off the c7 escape square. So that's checkmate. GG's, um, Spectre. That was an interesting game. I'm not sure about this whole h6, g5 strategy, though. H mm, the computer the computer really doesn't like the move h6. I feel like it's just kind of wasting time. I understand your thought process with this, trying to go g5 to undermine my pawn, but I think your first port of call should probably just be developing moves like knight to e7, knight f3, maybe even g6, bishop g7, but maybe c5, maybe bishop, sorry, maybe b6, bishop b7. There's no need to be pushing a ton of pawns in front of your king, especially when you're not developed yet. But GG, bro. I'll get into the game review and hopefully I can give you some tips as well and see whether the computer agrees with me, disagrees with me, agrees with my opponent, disagrees with my opponent. Uh, if you guys made it to the end of the game, then thank you very much for watching. The game analysis is coming up, so stay tuned. And if you're not subscribed already, please drop a subscribe if you made it this far in the video because clearly... You are finding some kind of value, whether it's, whether it's educational or whether it's entertainment. And for those of you who are already subscribed to the channel, thank you very much. Love you lot. Let's get into the analysis. All right. So as I've already said, thank you very much to Spectre for playing. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you can learn a lot from this video. So the game review, I had 92.3% accuracy. And Spectre had 74 flat. Not a bad game. I'll be interested to see where the computer critiques me and my opponent. And where we went correctly. So, B3, D5. This is a very strange line of the Karo Khan. 
And like I said, I'll link it to a playlist below where I play this against the French defense as well. But I have played it against the Caro in a couple of videos previously. Now, the thing is, after bishop b2, d takes e4, black can hold on to this pawn. So after knight c3 attacking, knight f6 defending, queen e2 is what you normally play in the French version of this. But here it's not really any good because of bishop f5. And the only way for, for white to really add more pressure is to go g3, bishop g2. And black has a lot of time to develop normally. I'm not sure if he can actually continue to hold on to the pawn or not. Knight a6, bishop g2. I'm following the top line here. Uh, knight b4 attacks c2. So if castles, then there's queen b6. And if you then try to take then a2 falls, and also if everything gets traded here, not like that, then f2 also hangs, although this would hang a knight, but just as a point of reference, I think that's part of the idea of queen to b6. Basically though, after um, d5, bishop b2, takes knight c3, knight f6, Queen e2 doesn't really work, so the move is knight g to e2. Now, this is a very strange system. Uh, there's a good chance that if you're watching this video, you've never seen this opening before unless you've seen me play it previously. And the idea is um, of knight to e2 is that after bishop f5, I want to go knight g3, attacking the pawn and attacking the bishop. And in this uh, position, the most common move is bishop g6. Then I can play queen e2, and then I win the pawn back. However, the best move in this position is not bishop g6, it's actually e6. And the point is, if I take the bishop, then e takes f5, and e4 is very well defended. So it's better to go queen to e2 here, and you continue putting pressure on. And to be fair, black can't actually hang on to this pawn anymore. The computer believes the position is a bit better for black because black hasn't wasted a move with bishop g6 and he's instead just gone e6 straight away, ready to develop his dark squared bishop. But I really like these positions. There's a lot of dynamism with like long castle, short castle, throwing these pawns forward, my opponent throwing pawns forward. And although the computer gives minus 0 0.2, if you're familiar in these positions and your opponent is not, there's a good chance you can get some very nice games as white, which I have many times in the past on my channel. Like I said, check out the last episode of the Rapid Rating Climb series. That game was in this opening, absolutely wild. My opponent goes knight d7 though. And I go e5, just taking space. You can exchange on d5, but I didn't see the point, because then the only real way to justify this is to go d4. And if I go d4, then I'm kind of just voluntarily blocking my bishop off. You can argue that e5 does the same thing, but a pawn on e5 takes up some more crucial squares than a pawn on d4, in my opinion. So my opponent goes e6, which is a good move, opening up his bishop for development. I go f4 uh, for all the... Meant, uh, reasons that I mentioned during the game. h6 though is a weird move, so I was expecting either knight to h6 or knight to e7. If knight h6, which is one of the computer's favourite moves, knight f3, you maybe don't want to go to f5 immediately because of g4, but then you do have knight h4 trying to trade off, and white can't really take because he's going to get absolutely slaughtered. So... Yeah, he goes h6, though, which I didn't really understand. I go queen g4, which is apparently a mistake. So knight f3 is better. And then the game just continues with moves like c5, knight e7, queen b6. All just very normal French Caro type moves. Queen g4 is a mistake, though, because of knight e7. Now, I was a little bit concerned about h5, but I thought that I was good if I go queen to h3. g5 is a move here, though, because I take my eyes off of the g5 square, and it's supported by the queen. 
But yeah, it just says knight e7, and then if knight to f3. I don't know, b5 is a good move. I don't see how this is a mistake, really. I think it applies some nice pressure, personally, but... Okay, who am I to argue with the computer? g5 is the move that's played. You don't really want to take this, because you can take with the pawn, or you can take with the queen, and... Black just gets unnecessary development, in my opinion. Um, so I just... Instead, go knight to f3 and go, yo, if you want to take me, then I'm going to take back with the queen. And I'm going to move my bishop, probably to e2, castle, create a battery down the f-file, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Instead, he goes f6 after knight to f3, which just allows queen h5 check. Now, if queen h5 check wasn't a thing, he might be okay, although e6 is also hanging. But I feel like queen h5 check, well, it is the best move. Because the king's really running out of squares. Like, bishop check here. If you can't block this, I mean, you can, but if you couldn't, it would be checkmate. And it turns out bishop a3 check is actually a miss. Because c5, and like, it's kind of difficult to actually break through this. So after king e7, we take on g5, which is actually the best move. So I'm very happy to have seen that. I didn't want to take on f6, because knight f6, and black is better because he just attacks my queen that's crazy black's actually better in this position so it is actually difficult um in this scenario we take on g5 though which i thought was the best because you can't take back uh, with the h pawn because i attack the rook f5 is apparently the best move and then after g6 i'm just up a pawn the king's exposed but black does block off some movement by ensuring that my pawn is stationary but he goes well sorry if he were to take back here then my plan was knight g5 because you can't take because i take the rook so queen e8 was the only move that i saw and i didn't see anything better than doing this threatening this and you can't play king d8 because i control this square and if you go king to e7 Apparently I can just retreat, and I have a ton of pressure. Black's struggling to develop. My development is nice and easy, and uh, this should be a fairly easy conversion. Um, so maybe it was a more practical option to play bishop g7. But I do just go up a piece, though. So I guess it, it was a lose-lose for my opponent, really. Giving up the bishop was surprising, though. I thought this made far more sense. And after this, um, after knight takes, ah, then I can give this check because c5, I take the pawn. So you would have to play, oh, you're getting mated. So, wow. So you'd have to give up the queen. So it is better to take with the bishop, actually. And after takes, knight takes. I mean, I'm still up a piece, so why worry? Anyway, he takes with the bishop. We take take. He attacks my queen. Queen h4. e5. We can take here with the knight. Absolutely. But, I don't know. I thought that he was kind of okay. I guess he's not, really. But I didn't. I just didn't really want to trade pieces. I thought he just opens his bishop up. His knight here was terrible anyway, so why trade it off? So I go bishop e2, which the computer says is the best move, so maybe it was. Rook g8 attacks g2, and I castle. Uh, rook g4, we take h6, queen g8, and we find knight h4, which is the best move, because I explained during the game it does so many things. Threatens these checks, defends g2, attacks the rook, opens our rook up. It just does everything. He goes rook e4. Knight c3 is the best move. And the rook's just running out of squares. He goes knight g4. Like I said, if he goes here, he gets checked and I win the rook. If he goes here, then I skewer the rook. And there's no other safe squares. If he goes to f4, then I again fork the king and the rook. 
So knight g4 is played, attacking my queen. I give a check. King goes to e8. I give a check on h5 to get my queen out of danger. And funnily enough, it's actually better to take the rook than to give a discovered check. Interesting. After takes... Okay, bishop g4 was a bit more accurate. I guess the point is that the king has no escape. Um with my knight on f5. Maybe that's the idea. Whereas where I, when I move my knight, the king can go to e7, so it might lead to a quicker checkmate. But we win the queen. Knight to f6. Take. Remember, the knight is pinned, so our queen is absolutely fine. It's funny that this isn't even the best move. The best move is to take on g4. And if bishop g4, rook f6, king e7, knight j check, there, there, and I guess he's just getting mated. Ah, okay, yeah. But uh, it doesn't really matter, because we're low on time, we play the easy moves. Just win a ton of material, and then the checkmating pattern is forced. So that's the game. Like I said, I know I was playing against a far lower rated opponent, and I'd like to get your guys' thoughts on whether it's still quite useful hearing my thought process, even though my opponent's lower rated. He definitely played better than what I would expect from a player rated 450, so fair play. Um, I found some interesting defensive resources, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether it's worth playing players this much lower rated than me or not. So please let me know, be brutally honest, like... And as long as you don't just insult me, then constructive feedback is ideal for me because this channel is meant to educate you. So your thoughts on what educates you the best are the most important, obviously, because I'm not you. I don't know what you find most useful. Anyway, you get the point. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.